My name is Antana Zabulis, and I will be, and I'm the chairman of the, of the Baltic Institute of Corporate Governance, chairman of the Council for the Baltic States, and I will be trying to, to be the, the chairman of the today's and tomorrow session. So this conference is the 13th in a row of European Corporate Governance and Company Law Conferences following the rotation EU Presidency. And of course, Vilnius is very, very happy of hosting this, this conference. By coming today, I was trying to do some small homework in the evening, and, and I looked at the weather forecast. They said it will be for sure Indian summer. So today is around 13 degrees, which is quite nice. Unfortunately, the sun is missing, so it's only like a half of the Indian summer, and I wish maybe that will come tomorrow. You know, Lithuania is, is an old state, and, and Vilnius itself, it's a, it's a very old city, and including the, the city hall where we are present today. And I have looked upon a couple of dates which, which could be interesting. The Lithuanian statute, which was adopted in 1529, I'm not sure if this was in the city hall, probably not. At that time, the city hall was not yet existent. And there was also another date which a little bit relates also to the corporate, corporate governance issues. That's the Lithuanian and Polish uh, declaration, which was established, uh, adopted at the 1791 on May 3, which at that, at that time it was one of the first in Europe. And uh, the aim of that declaration was to make more democratic governing model. And I guess some of these principles are quite widely used today in the democratic countries. So today uh, we are in Vilnius and I would like to start with a small video about uh, Vilnius city. So please enjoy. Okay, so today our conference will have uh, four panel discussions focusing on the realities of institutional shareholder behavior, encouraging long-term shareholder engagement, governance challenges for unlisted companies and shareholder value creation of state-owned enterprises. 
And also we have a, a, keynote, a keynote speech later today from Mr. Ugo Bassi on corporate governance in EU countries and, and of course much, much more uh, presentations. And one important also note is that tonight will, it will be a, a reception at the Arsenals at uh, 8 o'clock. Be, uh, be quite a nice place and uh, I encourage you to come hungry because that would be also followed with some standing dinner. Our first welcome speech was supposed to be uh, made by the Prime Minister, but unfortunately the Prime Minister, what I understand, he is right now in a parliament, and, and you know what is a parliament, we have requested to answer some questions, so he regrets that he, he is not able to give an op uh, the opening speech. And then I am straight going into the first session, the opening session of our conference, and uh, the session which uh, this time focusing on shareholder from responsible investment towards long-term engagement. And we'll have uh, three speakers. Mr. Eveldus Gustas, the Minister of Economy of the Republic of Lithuania. Mr. Robert Zergis, the President of the Lithuanian Confederation of Industrialists, also the member of the, uh, of the Corporate Governance Council of the Baltic Corporate Institute, and also Mr. Torben Balegard Sorensen, who is the board member of Electrolux, Pandora, and Egmont Publishing. So, Mr. Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dear participants of this conference, I am pleased to welcome you here in Vilnius, where you are arrived to discuss corporate governance issues. As we all know, corporate governance uh, initially refers to structures and uh, pre procedures to be applied to listed public, public uh, companies. In concern uh, the relationship uh, among uh, shareholders, bo uh, boards, uh, management, stakeholders and society as a well. whole. But now the nation of uh, corporate governance is even more broadening. Together with the listed companies, it also covers unlisted public and private companies as well as state-owned enterprises. These companies need to find and keep good balance among all the elements of corporate governance to gain success and to be competitive in the market. Every company needs qualified board of directors and management, and let's focus today on skilled uh, shareholder. Skilled shareholder know their rights and know how to use them, in particular for promoting good corporate governance in companies in which they invest. That leads to election of competence-based board of directors and senior management, and finally is resulting in improvement of companies' business performance. Shareholders, as the owners of company, can best look after companies and their own interests if they properly use their rights. Differently from other uh, shareholders, behavior of institutional, uh, institutional investors uh, should be admitted. They accept the funds from the third parties and have specific objectives to achieve. Improvement of corporate go governance with regard to the institutional investors uh, should be aimed at uh, encouraging and facilitating long-term uh, shareholder engagement behavior. It also should be related to disclosure of voting policy, uh, to the management of uh, conflicts of interests, and to cooperate between the investors. Now, I would like to address the unlisted uh, companies issue. Small and medium enterprises uh, represent more than 98% of businesses in, in the EU. They are the key driver for economic growth, innovation, employment, and social integration. That is uh, why good corporate governance is particularly important to the shareholders of unlisted companies. 
the fact that unlisted companies mostly are one-member or family companies and prevents frequent transfer of shares and keep investors in the role of medium and long-term shareholders with the interest to develop, de develop good governance. And finally, some views on corporate governance of state-owned companies. State-owned uh, enterprises contribute to the economic growth and employment, support the national budget by taxes paid, and uh, provide important services to public and businesses. The import importance of state-owned enterprises was also stressed during the informal meeting of the EU Competitiveness Council ministers this July in Vilnius. Recently, Lithuania has changed, changed its uh, policy from privatization to good governance of the state-owned enterprises. In order to achieve good results, the transparency and ownership guidance were adopted and necessary institutional arrangements were made. The reform was noticed and positively evaluated by the European Commission. We become active participant in OECD Working Party on state ownership and privatization. Dear ladies and gentlemen, today I have touched on just a few important issues related to shareholder as a responsible investor directed to long-term engagement. Policymakers and private businesses face new problems arising in the rapidly changing legal and economic environment. They also see possibilities for improvement of their corporate governance principles and related regulation in both soft law and hard law. I'm happy to note that together with national developments, significant changes are coming from the European Union and the OECD. I believe that discussions in this conference will result in some input to the future regulations and recommendations. And finally, I take opportunity to wish great success for conference participants and please, uh, pleasant and memorable stay in Vilnius. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. And now, Mr. Robert Azergis, please give your remarks. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. It's a pleasure to welcome you in such a good conference, which is organized by big efforts of Christian, I hope, <laughs> and uh, Ministry of Economy, of course, is the main one. Let uh, allowed me to share a little bit uh, information, which I think is very important and, of course, must be touched in such kind of conferences. A flaunty grant why the world raised as a competition between the countries. Tense competition requires very precise, effective, and coordinated actions on the company's management level and also understanding from the shareholders in terms of long-term corporate objectives and grow of value. Historically, development of market economy in Western democracies has been far dug in the development of efficiently functioning corporate governance structure However, today it is already past time. Companies in the growing markets today do not match already by their effectiveness to the old world companies, and in some cases they even outrun them. We should not forget another dimension, Western world government's obligation to their societies and the related costs. Unfortunately, there is not a big room for manure. Especially figures what I know and I can share with you, which I was told in, in one conference, for me is very, how to say, very important that in European communi community we have about 7% only world population only. And European community do about more little bit than 15% of GDP of the world. But imagine that European community pays 60% of social payments of the world. 
I think that is very, very impressive figures. And when I'm discussing about room for manure, it, it is not a big one, what I have in mind. Of course, this patch is impossible without one more important point. In this global competition, effective and intelligent public administration is high power and support to business. Detailed knowledge of the problems, effective destruction of the barriers, creation of creative space for people, those are the things that will ensure the long-term advantages and the future to the companies in long distance. Today, it's necessary to discuss and make decisions on corporate governance, in particular the efficiency and high quality work on the boards. The largest and most measurable added value is created here. It is area Lefene really has to do to, uh, a lot to do. Let us be reminded that the oldest private Lithuanian company is only little more than 23 years old. This is after all complete yoke. Foreign capital companies operate in Lithuania according to the Western business standards, but we cannot say uh, uh, about Lithuanian companies. Many of them, as appropriate, are family-owned companies which in large part ruled by obscure performance decisions, sometimes dictated by their understanding, knowledge, and historical experience. Instead, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Baltic Institute of Corporate Governance, and especially Christian again, whose energy and expertise contributed to the Lithuanian corporate governance getting closer to the Scandinavian standards. I think we are looking a bit and difficult job here to increase the efficiency and value of the Lithuanian business along with all the new European Union countries' business values. Separately, I want to talk about the state-owned enterprises. After the Soviet Union times, due to the market economy, we have not yet discussed how much state we want in economy and how much it will be effective to have. Most infrastructure companies, and not just them, are still in state hands. Efficiency of their management and flexibility influence the competitiveness of all operated state business. After all, the infrastructure companies are a substantial portion of our business costs. And here all the acceptable Western standards of doing business must come. CEOs, expertise, rather than party affiliation, should be the first unit of measurement. Lithuania is already moving in that direction. We should probably welcome the tendency that changes in management of that kind are decreasing and the boards of state-owned enterprises increasingly contain independent members. But in terms of profitability, investment return and stock yields, does business today satisfy the shareholders, that is the whole society interest, is a question to be asked. In my opinion, these issues are to become aspirational. I believe this conference has gathered one of the brightest people concerning corporate governance in Europe. This pleasures me very much and persuades that these two days will be of most value to all. I wish you all the great and valuable days, as well as a great stay in Lithuania. Thank you. Thank you much, Mr. Dergis. And, and actually, when I look at the audience, I see so many graduates from the Baltic Institute of Corporate Governance. So for sure, it will be a lot of, uh, a lot of messages taken uh, from the gurus, which, which will be giving a lot of speeches today. So let me uh, now ask for the stage, Mr. Torben Valgard Sorensen, the board member of Electrolux, Pandora, and Egmont Publishing. The floor is yours. I just have to operate this machine here. I think I'll manage it now. Yes, thank you. Thank you and uh, good afternoon. I've been looking very much forward to uh, join this conference um, and uh, this whole topic of board governance and uh, management effectiveness has really been top of my mind for, for quite a number of years. Uh, so, therefore, it's a pleasure for me uh, to, to be here today. Um, what I would like to emphasize during my uh, presentation is um, the um, word board and the word active shareholder and the word value creation. The latter is, of course, what it's all about. Uh, the, the theme of this first session is to do about long-term engagement of investors. And, and, and shareholders. And um, 
and that long-term engagement really implies duties for the uh, shareholders, which I will address uh, in my presentation. And four of those duties, in my opinion, are first of all, that the shareholders should find a way to select a qualified board, professionals to that board. They should monitor the board's quality on an ongoing basis, and they should ensure that there is a good long-term development uh, uh, of the combined talent uh, represented in the board at a given time. And, and fourthly, they should ensure a strong and proactive collaboration uh, between uh, the uh, board uh, and management team. Does this not work? Um, so these are the topics I would like to address. But before I do that, uh, let me just give a brief uh, slide about my own uh, background. I have been working uh, in executive tasks or jobs for like 30 years, uh, basically in three areas, or three company groups. One is, the, the latter one is about software, IT software exported to most of the world uh, within newspaper publishing. The other one, uh, Lego, I th think many of you know the toy company in the bricks, where I joined that company for a number of years. And finally, I've been CEO of, um, of Bang & Olufsen, which is also toys, but for older boys. Um, and uh, that has been a very good experience for me. But then I actually spent 15 years going back in time, joining a number of different boards. The recent ones and the current board assignments are with, to, to mention the bigger one first, Electrolux in Stockholm, uh, Egmont uh, Fonten, which is a fairly big uh, publishing and film manufacturing or film producing company based in Copenhagen. And Pandora has to do with jewelry, which is toys for particularly women, uh, which is uh, also based in, uh, in Copenhagen and in, and in Bangkok. Then there are a number of uh, mid-sized, uh, family-owned companies where I'm uh, uh, participating as chairman, and I help also a number of new ventures uh, to start up from the ground, uh, which I always find fascinating. Prior to this activities, I have also been on the board of Lego uh, through the turnaround for eight years. Simcorp is another company, and VTI in Helsinki in Finland has been a big pleasure for me to be often in Helsinki and a number of other companies. So I have, in my uh, life, uh, been exposed to different kinds of uh, company ownerships. Um, listed companies, uh, privately held, family-owned companies, private equity, which I have found most enjoyable, uh, foundation, meaning uh, Stiftung in Germany, a foundation which is a self-owned entity, and, vi and ventures, finally. And it is on the background of this experience that I have uh, some slides where I share my reflections, and what I do is absolutely not true, uh, representing the truth. It is more my subjective reflections, and some of that may be wrong, and certainly none of that is based on the scientific research. It's just my own viewpoints. But let me go back to the topic that I started with. What are the duties for the shareholders if they really see themselves as not share flippers, but long-term share engagement uh, owners? To me, and if, excuse me for these primitive drawings, I uh, made them myself, um, obviously at the annual uh, general meeting, the shareholders will elect a board of directors. That is a normal uh, constitution in most governance systems. And uh, then the board of directors select the management team. In, in some countries, the shareholders also select directly the management team, but that's not my premise here. What is important is that the shareholders must ensure via the corporate governance that there is systematic yearly evaluation of the board's performance and how it works. And that includes also the management team. Furthermore, my advice and my experience is that it is very productive if the shareholders, depending on if they are institutional or many small owners, if they uh, in what you would call a nomination committee. Uh, that nomination committee would typically have representatives of some of the key shareholders and typically the chairman of the board and one member of the board. I'm personally on the Electrolux nomination committee and has gained a lot of experience from that work. That uh, nomination committee would typically gather throughout the year and evaluate how is the strategy compared to the company is what gaps do we have in the uh, board of, com uh, of, of directors, and based on that, 
there would also be a, an activity where you would constantly develop the competences, skills of the board so that you are prepared for the competition and prepared for implementing the strategy and helping management do so. And obviously, there may be gaps because companies are moving, and when such gaps occur, you would typically call in a professional search company and not just let the chairman ring around in his circle or her circles of friends. You would do that in a professional way. And out of that would typically come a number of candidates with where you would choose one or two and then ask the uh, AGM to elect um, uh, candidates uh, to be members of the board. And you would typically say goodbye to some members who have been there maybe more than six or seven years or who just don't fit anymore with the competence program that is needed according to the company's strategy. That uh, is the overall duty of the uh, nomination committee, and I think it's a very good and active instrument. You cannot generalize, but for companies, it's a good instrument for the shareholders to be more actively involved, and not only long rows at the AGM once a year. What I would focus on now is, given this inf influence and given this impact that the nomination committee, committee as uh, from the shareholders, uh, how can we now make sure that the board actually works in the daily business and that the management board plays together? Um, this is what I will focus on more now. Board. When you ask how do boards actually function, and I'm not thinking about the laws or the regulations at this moment, I refer to a Professor Meyer from Yale University who in 2010 asked many hundreds of executives and board members, not only in US, also in Europe, uh, asked how do you actually think your work is going? And not surprisingly, nine out of 10 board members said that they were really feeling they did a great job. I don't think they wrote it about it, that was probably their honest opinion. And that's very positive that at least they're happy with themselves. Um, but when you, then Mr. Meyer asked the executives, and, and they actually surprisingly said that only two out of ten executives felt that they got any valuable advice from their board. And some were even completely demotivated for collaboration. And uh, that is, to me, a big discrepancy between perception of what is the board supposed to do and what does it do in reality in the eyes of management. Um, but let me go back a little bit uh, to the basic. For me, uh, the fundament for creating value, which it's all about, must be that there is a firm fundament behind the company, that there is a firm uh, governance, a control, diligent control of whatever goes on in the company, of compliance to the law and the regulations, and of course, fundamentally for formal order. That is, of course, the core of anything that we could call a decent company. But outside that core, there is a lot of flesh and blood, uh, which has to do with competent leadership, it has to do with strategic development, innovation capability, and execution drive. These are not the words you find in the law text or in the regulations, but this is what drives value in reality, outside the core, and that process must be solid as well. When you enter this topic and come from outside and you read the reports, the guidelines, the many expert papers and what have you, you may get the impression that the core is what it's all about, and that there's just a thin atmosphere around it which has to do with real management. I'm not sure that that is right, a right balance, but that is often what comes across when you listen to uh, people who are experts in this field. Uh, for me, it's important to keep the right balance, and I'm happy to have a chance to say that at the outset of a corporate conference seminar, because you can easily dive out into areas which may not be completely relevant for the strategic processes. So how do we get that balance? And particularly, how do we achieve that balance in a world uh, is, which is so dramatically under, undergoing change and, and tougher and tougher competition. We know, all of us, that globalization, deregulation, technology changes, paradigms in all industries, and the shorter life cycles is a reality that faces management. So impermanence is, is a more realistic starting point than permanence. And therefore, I see many companies in many industries where we see ourselves as standing on an ice flake somewhere in the ocean, 
uh, there's still some ice left, um, and then you don't even know how long time will that carry our, our company, what, what is going to be the next And that is not something that the board can just expect or the shareholders can expect management to solve. They have to be actively involved in that process, opinion, and be a good sparring partner to, to developing such a future. So the key point is how can the shareholders, as active as they are, how can they rest assured that the board will really drive value going forward? That leads me to take a small view on the of the phenomena of the board of directors. And again, I cannot generalize at all, but my personal impression is that if we go 30 years back, back in the 80s and the 90s, many, many boards, at least in Scandinavia, were rather passive. They came times a year, they had the right coffee, and they were talking on the right agenda points, uh, and they were driven very much by tradition and rituals. This is what we used to do. Uh, the, the agenda and everything, you could almost put it uh, before the meeting as a standard template. That board was okay in those days, and nobody talked a lot about the board. Uh, it was not a present part of the company or the management. Now, then a lot happened uh, at the end of the last uh, millennium and around the shift of millennium. Um, Business scandals in UK and US, as we all know about, led to the uh, emergence of the SARS Baines Oxley and the Cadbury uh, report from, from UK, and EU followed through in the early part of this decade, of the last decade. Um, we also saw the Enron crime uh, basically eliminating the well renowned origin company called Arthur Anderson and Company, 95 years old. They were completely eliminated due to the litigations following the Enron crime. And that change actually led to a much more Americanized way for auditors to engage with management. When you read engagement letters from any of the big five uh, audit companies, you will see a lot of disclaimers on 20 pages about not having responsibility for anything else than putting the numbers right together. The rest, of course, is on management. And It has always been so, but it is much more dramatically uh, put to center stage that the board really has a heavy burden on its shoulders when reporting the financial. They cannot rely on the auditors only. We had the financial crisis, uh, which, of course, in many uh, sectors, not only the banking sector, led to really embarrassing substandard board conduct, and which, of course, gave more appetite to more rules and regulations. And finally, shareholder activists was not only a phenomenon in USA, also spreading into Europe, uh, having uh, de demands on, right, on, on, uh, on ethics and, and rights uh, issues. All of this movement here in the last 10, 15 years led to the board conduct becoming more driven by rules and regulation, a more formal formalization of that institution, which in many ways is great, but it also leads to a more backward-oriented focus of the board of directors and a more compliance-oriented focus. And I personally see many boards where half of the time is being spent on assuring for oneself that, uh, that the historic numbers are properly in all aspects and that compliance cannot be criticized at any point which is also great, it just has to be balanced. On top of that, the last 15 years has also seen more of a CNN approach to the press and to the analysts. You see now a lot of hype starting either with analysts uh, claiming uh, issues about a certain company and the press con uh, conveying or amplifying those messages and the market reacting even stronger. So we have more or less a hype situation in many uh, stock markets and uh, in many economies, which is hard to control, but which almost is becoming, is becoming a self-feeding industry uh, where you have sometimes to ask actually benefiting in the society from that hype. No matter what, that also gives pressure on the board. That also means that there's not only a backboard, but also ultra-short here-now focus, which has to be covered in the board. At the same time, we saw before, as everybody sees, this impermanence, the low visibility, the low predictability, at the high complexity facing more or less all management teams, whether, whether it's a big company or mid-sized family company, that complexity and complete uncertainty is really uh, uh, demanding on, on the team. So that means that the board really today is faced with a dilemma, an increasing dilemma, as I 
see it. Um, and if I should words to that dilemma or those dilemmas, it is on the one side to avoid errors, of course. On the other side, to create value. That's why they're here for not to, just to get the fee. And on the one side, to protect uh, the reputation of the company and of themselves, and on the other side, to push for development, get something going. On the one side, be in compliance, as I said before, and still be pragmatic and make things happen. Minimize risk, that's a whole topic for the, for the audit industry now to talk about risk management, and that's all great and good. But at the same time, we need to stimulate action as well. And finally, of course, the board should protect and think about the shareholder's interest, but at the same time also think about the company's best interest. I was at a conference like this in Oslo half a year ago, and uh, one uh, of the presenters there, uh, a very renowned uh, high-level Scandinavian chairman, uh, who had also been acting as CEO of some large companies in Norway, he said, when I work on public boards, meaning boards for listed companies, I find myself thinking mostly about uh, how to avoid errors. And then he also worked with private equity and private companies said, when I work on privately owned boards, I constantly think about how to create value. And that, to me, was a bit astonishing uh, that it came out so explicit, that, that, that uh, dilemma. And to me, it's a huge problem. If we end up having boards who comply on 200 rules but don't create value, I'm not sure that is what we want. To me, there are three ways forward. And again, it's completely my own subjective opinion. It would be completely wrong, and you may disagree. One way is we could give full power to one individual. That's what they do in America. In America, they don't have a board and an and a executive team or a forestand and Aufsichtsrat. In, in, in USA, they have a chairman and CEO who has complete power over the company and complete power over the board. The Jack Wills of this world, uh, the Iacocca, and, and you know, know them all. And the board of directors is only a rudimentary nomination committee. I'm exaggerating a bit here, but I think that is still the case in U.S. Only 7% of U.S. corporations are now dividing the roles between the board and the uh, and executive team. And uh, we have all been brought up with the John Vain uh, culture, and that is what really penetrates a lot of the mind mindset, not only in American companies, but also in all the schools where we read all the books, which all come from America. And uh, there they understand the idea is that the board shall either just get out of the way and not waste the time of management. That is sort of the underlying premise. My problem is that given the complexity of the world, we have to acknowledge that one mind and one person or one team or one ego can overview and understand the complexity fast enough uh, to handle uh, what's going on around the company and its landscape. So therefore, I think that lonely cowboy model it's a rudiment of the history, but I'm not sure that is what we should do in Europe. Then another thing to do go forward might be, okay, let's issue more rules and regulations. And I'm sure a lot of regulators would have a lot of fun doing that, and I'm sure you'll have a lot of that in, in, in the coming sessions here. And that's great and good. The problem is that if we go back to the vicious circle I had earlier, and let me take Denmark as an example, uh, there we had in 2002, uh, a little committee called Nørby, that was the name of the chairman, Nørby Committee, and they uh, gave birth to 28 great rules back in 02. They were all common sense, they were all needed, transparency, board, uh, board election uh, process, evaluation processes, and so on. Great ideas, and it all helped. There were a lot of resistance in Denmark, you know, conservative circles, but overall, today, everybody acknowledges that it's great and good. And the same you can see for the Cadbury in UK, it is well received and recognized that it helped companies going forward. And then uh, in Denmark, as in other countries, there has been additional committees, uh, new committees put in place to continue to work on this great uh, theme. And in Denmark, we had a committee which was uh, supposed to simplify things to make it more practical. And out of that came 88 rules um, for, for governance. And for graphical reasons, they reduced it to 46 rules, so it looks not as bad as it is. But fundamentally, we just got any, even more rules. And I think it's well known in organization behavioral science 
that if you put many rules in place, you end up having even more rules, because that's a human need. So we end up with even more backwards focus and even more compliance. And again, I'm exaggerating slightly, but that is really what I see at least. So I don't think that's a way forward. So to me, uh, I think we need to go back to basics when we talk about how do we get value created in the company of tomorrow? How do we get value from having board of directors paying fees to them and having management paying, paying salary to them? I think we need to get back to basics. And if you think about it, um, an executive team of a big or small company constantly have to puzzle in their mind all the new information they get from all kinds of sources and, and make a synthesis out of that. What is it we see? What is it we believe we can see as a pattern we can uh, decide on? Based on that, it's natural, of course, to update or craft a strategy so you know uh, what are we actually, uh, where are we going and why are we doing what we are doing. And then, of course, execute, implement that strategy. That's fundamentally what it's all about. There's a famous guy called Peter Drucker. Probably some of you have read his book. He's dead now. I met him in uh, Brussels back in the 90s. At that time, he looked like he was already dead, but he was still there. And uh, he, a very wise guy. And he actually said in some of his book, in one of his books, uh, a very clever thing, which you shouldn't spend a slide on, but I do. No organization can sustain if you cannot work on the assumption that its members, including management, are perfectly normal human beings. Sometimes tend to forget that, both in the popular magazines where they make heroes out of managers as if they are superhumans, or in the law systems where we think they are either criminals or some different, uh, different human beings. And to me, I think we need to go back and the problem is that many of the regulators and nice people who work on that have never been in a company. They never managed a team of people to develop a profit and loss and result for that. So they forget that it's normal human beings. But if you follow me on the premise that it is normal people, then all of us, I believe, will need, when we have a complex problem, we need somebody to talk, somebody to have a sparring or a dialogue with. That's often what I see is helpful when you want to do problem solving, unless you are John Wayne who can just do it by ref reflex. If that's the case, obviously it's a problem if you have a very passive board who are just sitting there because their father sat there or their lawyer sat there or somebody else sat there, they don't do anything active. They're not really involved intellectually in that company. And furthermore, if the shareholders are rather passive, it could be institutional shareholders, for them, it's just one piece of a whole portfolio, and they really hate to get too much involved in practical stuff. So that's also a problem. Where can management get that inspiration from? Well, some managers can find inspiration from peers, you know, um, groups where you exchange um, experience and you meet maybe uh, at some rotary or some stuff. They can also maybe talk with their colleagues, but maybe many of the colleagues they've had for some years and they know the viewpoints almost before they start talking. So that's not giving a lot of feedback or challenging on ideas and, and, and perceptions. Of course, many uh, managers can talk with their spouse about the problem, but he and she might get tired at a point in time about all those damn problems. Uh, so many managers or executives end up, uh, you know, talking with their dog. Uh, and that is not only uh, Sense. But actually, if you read the book by Lou Gerstner, when he turned around uh, IBM uh, back in the late 90s, he wrote a book called Why Elephants Can Dance. And there he explains that he walked on the beach of Long Island and talked with his dog about the mainframe business. And I don't know if that came, the, uh, that was what helped him, but nevertheless, that is an opportunity, but it's not good enough to know that. What we need, obviously, are active shareholders who are able to select either directly or via a nomination committee, uh, select a, a board of high uh, caliber, high performance uh, capability, who then, um, uh, that board is then able to go coach or guide, not manage a company, but put the right questions to management, just inspire management, energize management. That is important. And, and but based on that, my uh, not only uh, hypothesis, but what I've seen in practice is that out of such a collaboration, you will see uh, a trustful uh, openness, which of course is fundamental because if you don't trust each other, forget about teamwork. 
um, where there's a mutual respect and where there is underlying a shared vision, where do we want to take this company, whether it's a small one or a big one, and where also the value system is the same. We have the same beliefs in what is right and wrong, and what are we here for, and how do we behave in society, and such kind of values. If that is working well, then my experience is that you can really get a lot of energy out of such a collaboration to the best interest of the shareholders. I mentioned Electrolux before. One example, Markus Wallenberg, who is a chairman of, of that board where I'm on, uh, he has this ability, even in the most dark hour, when some really irritating things are happening, to still encourage management to say, you know, we are behind you guys, we think you're doing the right decisions, it's tough, we can't believe how you can get to work every morning, uh, but nevertheless, we are behind you and, and keep pushing. It will take three years, it'll be hard and bloody, but we will do it. That kind of, um, of, of encouragement is very helpful, assuming that management, and this is Swedish people, they're normal human beings, uh, that can really help a lot on driving a company forward. And I've seen many similar cases. That the advantage is that if you have this dialectic, dialectics between the board and the management group, not one same person, but that dialectic, it really helps you to have two different perspectives because many competitive problems, like what can Google do tomorrow to this industry, or what will the restructuring of this retail uh, happen, uh, what will that mean tomorrow to our company, and uh, what can this breakthrough of nanotechnology, whatever. Uh, many of these issues are difficult, and therefore if two different roles, two different perspectives meet and challenge each other, in an openness, then you can sometimes get better result than if it's just a matter of management reporting routinely what they have decided, what they think about the world. So this difference in distance is important. The board can never know, of course, as much as management. They will always know more. But the board is not buried into the daily business, but still it understands the strategy and the landscape and therefore can provide a competent sparring to the, to the management. So that is uh, my, at least my thinking about what, uh, what governance is also about. Not only rules, but also about human collaboration, which I think we should never forget. Then you can ask, uh, how can the board find time for that inter in interaction? And, you know, the board, let's say they meet once a month for eight hours or six hours. I mean, it only is so many hours. And how can there be time enough? Because if you look, um, at, at, at the tsunami that is coming towards uh, an ordinary board, uh, then that, of course, has to be complied with, but that takes in itself a lot of time. So here the board has to protect common sense. It's a word that actually exists, common sense. It's very important for many businesses. And there the board has a, a filter role, in my opinion, to be a little bit the bulk wall against too much uh, uh, rules coming in over the company. Also, uh, for, the press, uh, for the press and the analyst and the stock market I mentioned before, also there, the board has to be a little bit protecting management, saying, yes, there's a lot of hype on the stock market, a lot of wild press coming out, and a lot of bad things maybe uh, speaking about us, but still, let's focus on the business. Once the company starts to be stock market-driven and not market-driven, it is really dangerous, and therefore the board has to be able to stand up against that situation. Finally, uh, the agenda for a typical board, of course, has some fundamental value in itself. There has to be the management report, there has to be financial report, and there has to be household items like investments and so on. All that has to be dealt with as part of business. But the trick is, that the board can be more efficient. Many other processes of a company are being enhanced in terms of efficiency, and so also the board could be enhanced in its way of working. Like, for example, operating with one or two page reports and not 50 page reports, like management translating complexity to something that is simple to understand uh, for, for the people, like working with the eyes um, and not with long uh, boring reports uh, of, uh, of IFRS uh, rules and, and stuff. I have seen, for example, Lego company, there we are running the reporting basically on three pages with KPIs, not only financial, also service systems, product launching, and, many, and, and visitors to the stores and so on. So uh, 
I think it can be condensed and become more relevant and more real life and real time re related. And finally, household items can also be prepared and packaged better. What should we then do th with the idle time, the, the, the bandwidth that comes out here? Well, to me, the strategy should actually be addressed at every board meeting, not for two hours or a long time, but just addressed to say, has something dramatically changed in our landscape since last time? Do we need to revise some of our assumptions, or are we on, on the right route forward? The next point, which is very important and often forgotten, is do we execute? Often strategies end up in nice binders and the consultants get their fees and nothing happens. There it's very important that the board, not in a control mood, but in a sort of facilitating mood, says, are we executing to those five value drivers that we decided to execute on, or are we just having them sitting over there and, and being swallowed up in daily business? That is value creation, and that is what, what the uh, private equity owners, in my opinion, they're probably both good and bad, but the good ones really are great at driving that uh, execution side of the, of the company strategy. Health markers I won't address, but that's about company culture. Are we getting arrogant? Are we, getting, uh, f are we forgetting our consumer? Are we just being enough in ourselves and stuff like that? That is another issue uh, which I won't address here. So if I should conclude uh, these few scattered remarks, uh, basically I would say that this journey that the board has undergone since it was a, a sleepy, uh, hidden, passive organization or team into become more formal driven, it still has to be base itself on the formal compliance, but we might move up to uh, what I would call the interactive board where we have active dialogue, cooperation and so on, focus, uh, focus on, on forward uh, issues. That, I think, is important. Um, so, if I only had one slide, I would say we don't need more slides on how to do things right. I think many boards need slides and inspiration of how to do the right things. And we should not forget that, no matter how much we love corporate governance. I think it's very important, in my opinion, as a practical person. The thoughts I have just described here um, came to my mind after I've been working in, in, in different companies, as I described, and I tried to put those thoughts together in a, in a little book, uh, which actually I launched, and this is the only advertising here, which I, which I launched uh, this summer in the second edition on Amazon. Uh, I wrote every word myself, so it's not complete good English, but it, it's it readable. And there I'm actually addressing some of the points that were on my mind, and it was uh, in itself a good process. Uh, the book is boring and long, but uh, you can flip through it here and there and find, perhaps find inspiration if you feel that some of these ideas might be right. I think that's all. Um, my email is there. I have a spam filter, but don't, don't hold back if you have something to criticize. Um, so I think that was my contribution for now, and I think time is running. But Orban, really, I would like to keep you a little bit on stage because uh, you've done it uh, like two, three minutes before we lunch break, uh, before we coffee break, mm -hmm. and I think it will be a lot of questions uh, you will be asked during the coffee. If you can put your presentation the two slides back, uh, I think. Okay. Uh, what I liked a lot it's about uh, about the being human beings because sometimes oh, we one. really run into some procedures only. And, and especially this is also uh, very much related also to the uh, to young companies, like the companies in Lithuania, because at least what I've seen, a lot of companies where the owners, they would like to have, uh, to have a board, they would like to have some yeah. governing bodies, but, but sometimes they, they have some sort of a little bit mistrust or they, they are not capable of making a first step. Are there any thoughts uh, from your side on how to make a first step? Because that's quite crucial. Well, uh, for Denmark, like I think for your country, most of the businesses are very small family-owned businesses. Uh, you mentioned that we are, I mean, we are like 80% are small, really small businesses of 20 or 30 people. And for many of these companies, I have been together with many uh, such owners. And for them, it is a personal development for themselves to come to the recognition that what will help them is really to have somebody to talk with. Uh, and to have a professional board, not to be an uh, Olympic ma meister in, uh, in, in all the formal stuff, but to really have a competent buying partner. And, and the good 
boards and the good owners come through that transition, which is difficult for themselves to give a little out of their ownership and their, uh, of their power, so to speak. But I think the mature guys and girls, they do that in a, in a deliberate way, and I, and I really can see good results from that. But it is a mental reprogramming you have to go through because many entrepreneurs want to have the whole control all the time. Thank you. Any questions from the audience, please? Yes, please. Uh, there is a mic here. Susanna Hahn from European Issuers of Brussels Bank. Would you suggest, given your comments earlier, that corporate governance code should be cut back now to around 20 principles? Because I guess the question is, do you think boards actually read the 88 or not? Well, uh, fundamentally, my message is, yes, I think we should show ourselves, like we do in all other management tasks, distill the essence, what is real important, and then implement that, for God's sake, instead of pumping more rules, which hardly can be implemented because small companies or big companies are way behind. And if we put more rules on them, they'll just end up spending one hour running over all the lists and, and, and you know, abgehaken, as they say in Germany, and that's it. But it doesn't shift the mindset. And the good intentions of governance is to get a better mindset. And therefore, I would rather hold back and go back to 28 or whatever you go back to, the essential that are really important, and do that right. And then later on, we might expand. The problem is that some of the bureaucrats in the EU, if I may say so, I don't know if some in are here, uh, they don't know what's happening out in the practical life. And so they just pump more rules out there as a, as a mechanical reaction to what happens on the financial crisis. And God, I really am with you in terms of controlling the banks and all that. Don't worry, I'm, I'm on that. But much of that is spinning over into small companies who hardly can manage all those rules. And they forget to run the business, and half of the board time is spent on running rules instead of running business. And, and therefore, I think that it takes some discipline, now I say in Brussels, but in all those nice people who work with this uh, area, which is very helpful, and I really like those 28 rules, but go back to basics and understand that this is only half of the equation. The other half is life and blood. Thank you. So now it's uh, half an hour so coffee break, and let's be back at half past three. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Very, Come nice. on. Very, very good. Very good.